For our third speaker, we have Professor of Communications, Christine Seifert. It I took several classes from Christy during my time at Westminster. While I was here, she taught me a lot about my writing, helped me discover my own voice and my style, and develop it. She taught me how to give a presentation in front of my peers without being afraid, which is coming in handy. <laughs> and she showed me what it means to have a professor who truly cares about her students. The lessons I learned from Christy have been helpful tools as I have been out in the world and experiencing the scary life after college. But Christy did more for me than deliver what she promised on a syllabus. She encouraged me to try new avenues and cheered me on in pursuit of my dreams. She helped me get into graduate school at New York University and was one of the first people I told when I landed my first network job. She has been a guide in my career and even more than that, a true friend. Christy exemplifies what it means to be someone whose work goes beyond the classroom. She's a teacher and an inspiration. Christy is well known for several of her magazine articles, including Bite Me or Don't, Analyzing the Twilight Phenomenon, as well as her young adult novel, The Predicteds, which has now been published in three languages. Christy has appeared on several prestigious television programs, including The Today Show and the NBC Nightly News, where she learned that she was better than Orrin Hatch. <laughs> Talking to us today about the messages in young adult literature, please welcome Christine Seifert. There's the first test. Okay, I got it on. It's true, they did tell me I was better than Orrin Hatch, but I'm not sure if it was a compliment. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so tonight I'm gonna be talking about young adult literature. And so I'm gonna start with just a quick poll and you can vote just by raising your hands. So how many of you have read at least one of the Harry Potter books? Okay, keep your hand up. How many of you have read at least one of the Twilight books? Oh, look, all the hands went down. Okay, how many of you have read one of the Hunger Games books? Okay, now how many of you have seen any of the movies? Okay, that's almost everybody except for like one person who, you know, is holding out. But young adult literature is everywhere. So this is a publishing phenomenon unlike anything the publishing industry has ever seen. Young adult literature is in its golden age. And in fact, contrary to what you might think, kids are actually reading more now than they ever have before. And it's not just kids, as you proved. So check out that astounding figure. More than 50% of young adult books are being bought by people over the age of 18. So this is a phenomenon that affects everybody. But hardly anybody studies young adult literature. It's almost impossible to find academic analyses of YA lit. Some people dismiss it as, well, it's just entertainment, so it doesn't matter. But I want to make the case that young adult literature is an important artifact to study, and it is something that we should be talking about. So tonight, I'm gonna to talk about some of the work that I've done analyzing young adult literature, and specifically, I study sex in young adult literature. I'm gonna to try to keep the content PG. Um, I, when I did a news show on some of my research, I was told I was not allowed to say the word porn, but I was told I can say porn tonight. So I'm gonna say it a lot, because that's part of what I'm gonna be talking about. <laughs> okay, so you know these people, right? These are the stars of the Twilight movie. In 2008, I read Twilight because it's all I heard about. Everybody was talking about it. Lisa's sitting down here just like making faces and um, Okay, but let me tell you, if, in case you are just sort of new to the planet and you don't know anything about Twilight, this is a book about a nice vampire and the ordinary teen girl who falls in love with him. So for more than 2,000 pages, Bella wants to jump Edward's bones. That's the plot of the book. That's basically it. Right? Okay. Edward, who's sort of a, uh, a he's kind of creepy. He's a 107-year-old man in the body of a 17-year-old boy. And he's chivalrous. He just says no for both of them. He's the one that keeps them um, in line. 
um, when they finally get married, they can finally, finally do the deed. Surprisingly, and you might not know this, many readers were downright disappointed. So, fans actually created an online petition demanding answers from the author, who is Stephanie Meyer, and her publisher, Little Brown. They wrote in part, we were your faithful fans. We are the people that you asked to come along with you on this journey, and we are disappointed. So this is about the last book where the characters get married and finally do it. So what was it that engaged fans in the first three books that led to such di bitter disappointment in the end? And I posit that the answer is something that I call abstinence porn. And that is a term <laughs> that I accidentally coined and if you Google abstinence porn, you find me. This is my claim to fame, right? So, <laughs> yeah. okay. So let me define abstinence porn for you. It's the presentation of virginity as the pinnacle of eroticism. So it tells us that the most titillating aspect of any sexual relationship is not the emotional or physical part of it, it's obsessing about doing it. It's about seeing virginity in peril. And some of you are nodding your heads because if you engage with young adult culture at all, you know that abstinence porn is a narrative trope that you see over and over and over again. So what I'm gonna show you tonight is some of the ways that abstinence porn works in young adult culture. So is Eve Clark here tonight? No? Okay. Eve is a recent Westminster graduate, and last summer, Eve and I did an analysis of young adult literature to determine how abstinence porn is functioning. This is the article that we wrote, and I'm going to share with you tonight just a couple of conclusions that we ended up with. Okay. If you walk into any bookstore, you're going to see a wall in the young adult literature section that looks like this. Most of these books are paranormal romance. Most of them use abstinence porn as a narrative technique. Here are some of the lessons that we learned after reading a series of 20 young adult books that are quite popular. We learned, first of all, virginity is almost always code for moral superiority in these books. So what that means is the books will usually have two female characters, one is the slut character. She's the girl who doesn't wait. Then there's the protagonist. She's the virgin. And she's going to spend most of the book obsessing about how she can be most tempting. And she's also going to be tempted through the entire book. So that abstinence porn narrative is going to require that these girls operate in what I call a state of unrelenting, obsessive sexual desire constantly feeling angst about whether or not to give up their virginity. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, has anyone read this book, Beautiful Disaster? It's a romance novel. It's very popular with the kids. <laughs> um, what you're seeing, I've always wanted to say that. Um, that's a, the book cover on the left side and on the right side is the proposed movie poster. So you'll be seeing this coming to your megaplex soon. In this book, um, bad boy Travis Maddox is a champion fighter in his college's fight club circuit. We've all got one of those, right? Yeah. Um, he, has, he has sex with every girl who, who wants to, and they all do. And he treats them like trash when he's done with them. In one particularly misogynistic scene, Travis has sex with two girls at the same time, and then he later calls them disgusting sluts. The protagonist of the book is a girl named Abby. She's a virgin, and she resists him, which is why he finds her so attractive. When he even suggests that she might have had sex with another guy, he says to her, or she says to him, I can't believe you just said that. That's a big step for me. And he says, that's what all the girls say. And so she responds, well, you mean the sluts you deal with. Then his face lights up, and he says, you're a virgin? And then they get married. So she, I mean, it takes a while to happen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's lesson two that we learned from these books. Girls who, f who feel sexual desire need chastity guardians. And these chastity guardians are usually men in the body of boys. So YA Lit, it's true, yeah. YA Lit um, is loaded with girls who really, really, really want to have sex. But it's 
almost always the guys in the book, the men, who protect the girls from giving in. So I'm going to show you another example. Here's Twilight again. Okay, so in the first Twilight book, Bella asks Edward if they'll ever be able to consummate their relationship. And he says, I don't think that that would be possible for us. And she says, <laughs> it's so corny. She says, because it would be too hard for you if I were that ellipsis close. And he says, um, <laughs> he says, yes. And then he reminds her that she's soft and so fragile and breakable. And this is my favorite line. I could, I could kill you quite easily, Bella, simply by accident. Okay, so he's in charge of making sure that not only does she not lose her virginity, but the virginity functions as a metaphor for her humanity. And interestingly enough, Edward is also protecting the narrative because if Bella were to give in, abstinence porn is over, readers are unhappy, we've got to stretch this out over four books, right? So Edward has a really important role. Okay, so after spending all of this time with young adult research, I'm uh, researching young adult literature, I'm convinced this is an important area of academic study. It's important to know the stories that we are reading and consuming and what they mean. So my current research is actually a book. Uh, this is the book proposal. It's actually currently with editors. And what I want to do in this book is look at the way that popular culture that's aimed at teenagers uses this abstinence porn message. So even the most seemingly libertine pop culture from Fifty Shades of Grey to Jersey Shore is sending this unified message. Sluts are bad. Virgins are good. Abstinence porn has to be reaffirmed at every turn. I also want to empower readers with tools to learn how to understand what it is that they're reading and what it is their kids are reading and watching. So I give you permission to keep your Edward poster in your bedroom. If you're a twihard, that's okay. I'm not saying pop culture is bad. I'm simply saying that we have to understand why we are drawn to these particular stories and what that tells us about ourselves. Thanks.